can change the world. Changing the way the world works and how with Impact Hub's Brian Howe. Brian, well. Thank you, Stan. It's good to be here. All right, so I put a lot of uh, burden on you, changing the way the world works, but you really kind of are, right? Uh, I, I don't know. That scares me. <laughs> uh, depends what you mean by that. All right, well, let's talk about the impact hubs. There are several around the world, uh, and you manage the one um, in Seattle, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the moment, I think we're around 60 sites in the world. Um, we're a cooperative. Uh, and so probably only interesting to a lawyer like me, but we're technically an Austrian federation, um, which means that each site uh, kind of has one vote in the global cooperative. Uh, and we're growing rapidly. So um, we're about double the size we were a year ago, and there's many more that would like to open. Uh, and in each city, we have a similar focus, um, but we really allow a lot of flexibility for what the individual founding team in any one location wa wants to manifest there or what they think the community and the city uh, needs from Impact Hub. Okay, personal story here. Uh, here at Rainmakers, we actually felt like that the energy was so high and it just so great that we wanted to locate here. And so we've actually found a, a good place to locate a studio here in the Impact Hub in Seattle. Uh, but this is really where an awful lot of business takes place, it seems to me. I is that accurate? So it's interesting. Uh, I think that um, there is no easy way to capture exactly what we do or um, find ways to do it more efficiently. That's something we're always working on. Um, we have a lot of different moments. Uh, my, my team refers to them as, oh, that was a hub moment, <laughs> where uh, we say that's, that's the sort of thing we're about. And a lot of it is, uh, happens somewhat, uh, what might appear accidentally, but it's really setting the stage for the accident to occur. Uh, and so the sort of things that we see as hub moments are times when someone um, very influential in either the business or philanthropic world comes and makes themselves available to our members who are generally on the earlier side of ventures. Um, we really aim to do three things well, provide inspiring workspace, provide a curated community, and targeted programming and events. And our focus is on purpose-driven ventures that aim to build the world we want to live in. So we're structurally agnostic. We work with for-profits and non-profits as well as many service pr providers. And that's relatively similar at any Impact Hub you visit. Well, so that was my question, was, was right there, is just for somebody who doesn't know anything at all about the Hub, just what is it? And you know, we're in the basement, if uh -huh. you will. But if we were to walk upstairs with several more floors, I see people all over the place. It, it almost looks like um, you know, a place where a bunch of college students have come to study, but there's people of all ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think our oldest member is in his 80s. Um, I, I don't know our youngest member, but we do have two organizations that do incredible work with youth here in Seattle. Both uh, Ashoka has the leading youth ventures um, uh, city uh, based out of Impact Hub here, and then One World Now, ran by Kristen Hayden, who is actually an Ashoka Fellow. Uh, she runs her organization here and they teach Arabic and Mandarin to youth and send them on trips overseas and really disrupt uh, in a very positive way the course of a young person's life through that exposure to a different culture. So we get a lot of uh, youthful energy around here, but I don't know quite who the youngest member is. We tend to have a cluster in the 20 and 30 somethings, but certainly plenty of members on either side of that range. You mentioned you were a lawyer. Um, how come you're not off making a bazillion dollars being a lawyer and instead you're making whatever running this organization? Yeah, so uh, my, my background prior to law school was more on the global development side. Um, academically, that's where I did my study specifically on urban issues within global development. Uh, and I went to law school with the intent of um, going to work on public uh, law issues. So. Uh, kind of with the belief that in order to have any sustainable solutions to the issues the world is facing, you really need strong rules of law in the economy where you're working. Um, because if you don't have kind of basic pillars around legal rights, economic rights, and property rights in place, as well as just equal access to the court system, nothing else matters. 
Um, and so I went to law school with that intent and fell in love with entrepreneurs accidentally. Uh, you know, one of those uh, looking for an extra class to take, happened to stumble into a community development and entrepreneurship clinic uh, and was placed with a client who was backed by a lo local microfinance bank and, and they were an entrepreneur who had received a loan from this microfinance bank and, uh, and um, from there found myself really constrained by the billable hour uh, so that I was working very long weeks, making a lot of exciting introductions, offering a lot of advice whether they wanted it or not, but <laughs> not doing a huge amount of legal work. And so I really wanted to find a model that allowed me to continue to invest my time, energy, resources, um, into the entrepreneurs that were particularly inspiring to me and not worry about whether or not they could afford a lawyer's hourly rates. Um, so I uh, transitioned the firm and um, joined a team to help launch Impact Hub and have been very glad with that solution. So I don't know if there's uh, bajillions of dollars to be made out in the, the legal world. I didn't see them when I was there, but uh, I'm quite happy with the solution. The Impact Hub in Seattle itself, is it like all the rest of the Impact Hubs around the world? You know, I've only had the opportunity to visit a handful of others. Um, there's some individuals within the network that have got to visit quite a few, uh, and I'm, I'm jealous of them, and I'd love to do an around-the-world trip. So if anyone out there wants to sponsor me on, a, you know, around the hubs in 30 days, I'm in. <laughs> uh, as far as the other hubs I've visited, obviously geography uh, makes it easier to visit the ones within North America. Uh, so I think we do have a lot of similarities to our sister hub. We have two sister hubs, one in Australia and one in the Bay Area, and we have a lot of similarities with our sister hub in the Bay Area, which was the first one to open in North America and really has been an incredibly generous leader for the Impact Hub movement. We've seen a lot open in the last few years since they planted themselves in, in San Francisco. So I'm, I'm out there, I'm watching this, I'm a social entrepreneur, I've got a good idea, I don't want to spend a ton of money on office space, why would I be considering an Impact Hub wherever I am? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so certainly the majority of our members, we have um, over 500 here in Seattle, um, are members because they're interested in um, the both community programming, but most of all the workspace. Uh, and so in that aspect, we're really um, joining a more global movement called co-working, which is a recognition that for many information age workers, they can work from anywhere. Um, the last census within the U.S. said that 30% of the workforce considered themselves mobile, uh, meaning have lap laptop, can travel. Um, and so uh, the last few years we've seen uh, a number of responses to the um, death of the traditional workspace. And um, that comes from the increase in coffee shops, the increase in home offices, but both of those lack community. And so what Impact Hub and many other similar organizations offer is a mobile, flexible workspace that works with your schedule, doesn't require you to conform to our schedule, and at the same time offers a really incredible, vibrant access to community, and you just can't get that anywhere else. Um, so uh, the workspace is important, but really at the end of the day, uh, we don't desire to have the best shared workspace or co-working space in the world. We desire to have a space that someone comes alive in. So um, our um, uh, Impact Hub in Oakland had this great phrase and they said, hub is where you bring what makes you come alive. And so uh, that's one of our aims, is to be the place where um, people bring their whole selves um, to their career, to their calling, and really uh, don't feel like they have to segment um, what they care about in their personal life, their family life, um, their community life, from what they do in their work life. So if you've got 500 members here in Seattle, there's not 500 offices here. No, so um, we do have offices here in Seattle. That's not true in every impact hub. We have some private offices where an organization is able to close the door and um, have the same space every day. Um, we have about 12 of those um, currently and are expanding actually um, within our current space to offer about 20 more. Um, but the majority of members are more in a coffee shop style setup. And I know we're gonna be able to show some, some clips of the mm -hmm. people working. Um, so they have shared desk. We have kind of a quiet zone um, where there's more individual workstations and then more of a collaborative zone. There are two different floors. Um, and we think about how the furniture is set up to encourage collaboration versus more heads down work. People are welcome to really choose any space they wanna work out of 
during the day. So the, the first floor, that's the collaborative space? That's right. And then the second floor, which you know we have scenes of as well, that's the space where, where people are really kind of heads down? That's what we think. Now, uh, of course, members make what they want of it, so it's always interesting to walk through the second floor. Uh, some parts of the day it can feel like a zoo, and other parts it can feel like a library, which I think is part of the fun of being here. The question is always, how do you uh, enjoy that energy and still manage to get the work done you need to get done? By the way, a lot of people my age think that millennials don't work hard. Hmm. That's not what I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing these, these people working very hard, and, and most of them, as you mentioned, are, are millennials. Yeah, it's interesting to see some of the shift in what it means to do good. Um, there's a number of good studies out there. I only have anecdotal stories, which is always a risk, but I'm going to risk them anyway. Uh, I know that um, there was an individual who was writing about his uh, recent visit to the Harvard um, Rowing Club. He was a graduate maybe in the 80s um, from the business school, and he said then him and all his colleagues talked about you know, how many millions of dollars are we going to make in the next few years? And that was kind of the conversation in the club. Mm -hmm. And he said, coming back there, you know, 30-some uh, years later, he solely heard, what sort of impact am I going to have in the world in the next few years? And then maybe the secondary question was, and how am I going to do that good while also doing well for myself? How am I going to be able to have blended value where I can both create impact and make money at the same time? Um, but just an interesting anecdote regarding the shift in how we approach doing good. So I think there's a lot more people who no longer um, believe uh, that we need to go out and make our money and then go do our good. That's what we kind of saw um, you know, previous generation, a very incredible and inspiring philanthropist who went out and uh, started businesses, um, you know, uh, started investment companies, did an incredible job of making wealth, and are now in the phase of uh, moving from uh, success to significance. Um, being a demanding generation, I think the millennial generation wants it at the same time. Can we have significance at the same moment of having success? Can we do Can good we? and do well together? Absolutely, I think it's possible. And I, I think there's a number of really inspiring ventures, both here at Impact Hub Seattle and throughout the network, and obviously beyond the network, we're a small sliver of the um, kind of movement that's happening. What's exciting to me um, from a global scale is the Impact Hub network has no affiliation outside itself, meaning that it really is a voluntary gathering of individuals within major cities throughout the world who say a different world is not only possible, but it's happening. And we are the ones to help make it happen. And uh, for the most part, there's a belief that uh, market-driven approaches do matter. Uh, certainly, we have people on uh, all sides of the political um, spectrum, um, uh, but many are entrepreneurial. That's mm -hmm. kind of one of the one of the things you'll find in all the impact hubs. Is there's a sense of um, real commitment to to new ventures um, and. Uh, a phrase that um, someone used to describe it once was an underground railroad for the new economy. Um, Bruce Herbert, who runs a socially responsible investment firm here in Seattle, uh, used that when I was describing Impact Hub to him. And his idea was it's these um, places throughout the world where you know you can go and find others who are moving on the road to freedom. Uh, and the road to freedom, you know, obviously that's a nice poetic term, but what does mm -hmm. it mean? It certainly means an economy that um, uh, cares less about the genetic lottery, uh, where opportunity is uh, equally available or at least made more available regardless of where you were born and who your parents were. Um, it certainly means um, measuring value at the point of stakeholders and not just shareholders. And by that I mean stakeholders are the employees of a company or organization, the community in which it is located, the environment that it affects, and the consumers of the product or service it creates. One of the favorite questions that I get to ask of companies is, who do you want your customer to become? Um, and measure your value at the point that you're creating value in their life. Uh, it also means a, a more generous economy, um, one that has a belief that collaboration um, as opposed to consumption is the new way forward. And we're seeing that all around the world. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that uh, because you, you, you've used words that don't sound business-like to me, someone who grew up in the business world a long time ago. You're using purpose-driven, you're using social entrepreneurship, you're using words that are different. And is this really the coming thing, or, or is it already come? Is it already here? 
are people, whether they're millennials or whether they're older, they truly are trying to make a difference in their business lives at the same time that they're building a business. Is that it? So uh, in terms of uh, sheer numbers, um, when you look at, um, uh, for instance, it's one measure, and maybe it's not the best, but when you look at um, where you know the trillions of dollars that flow in investments every year go, uh, the, the impact space is a almost um, incidental uh, amount of that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very small in the, that sense. Um, but in terms of influence, I think it's phenomenal. And I think that everyone is seeing the writing on the wall that this is happening, it has happened, and it will continue to happen. So I was right in the introduction. You are changing the way the world works, Brian. So uh, my, my title here at uh, Impact Hub is Town Crier. And the reason <laughs> why is uh, you know, very much uh, like any um, exciting endeavor, exciting venture, uh, it takes a village to build it, the same way it takes a village to raise a child. So I get to say I was the town crier who started um, calling out about, hey, shouldn't Seattle live into its legacy as the, the capital of impact entrepreneurship, of social entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. And I say that because we really have a unique city here. You know, About 30% of the workforce is in some, for, some way global, as I'm sure you know, um, that that's attached to their, their jobs, um, and that's partially given our geographic location, but also the type of ventures we ha uh, or industries and organizations we have, um, both here in the city and throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we're an incredibly charitable uh, city. Yes. Uh, so we're always ranked as one of the most um, willing to give cities. Um, and we're also very educated. Uh, and so people tend to know a lot about what's happening in the world. Um, they care about it and they're eager to learn more about it. So we have a, a great um, ecosystem in those regards. And I think there's every reason to think that, um, not that it's a matter of rank or, or claim to status, but in terms of helping move the ecosystem forward, that Seattle um, really is poised to be the capital of social entrepreneurship. Mm. We're showing, going to be showing some websites from impact hubs from around the world. And um, there are some of, of yours, I don't necessarily uh, say that they're your favorites, but there are some that are, are different and some that are similar. What are some of the differences in some of the impact hubs around the world? Sure. So it ranges from all sorts of things. The great thing is it's, um, uh, you know, again, this commitment to kind of trust and collaboration and entrepreneurship across the network. Um, and. Uh, where that has individual expression in each city is really in response to that city. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be part of the Impact Hub network is because uh, I saw far too many times in my past um, work in global development, people coming in from outside saying, here's the solution. Um, and uh, Impact Hubs are always people from the ground up saying we need a um, town hall where the inspiring entrepreneurs of this city, of this region, can gather and collaborate together around um, their shared intentions of what should be. And I, I'm very um, careful with that phrase, shared intentions, mm -hmm. as opposed to shared beliefs. Because I think the diversity within that is really incredible. We don't all share the same beliefs about how we get from uh, the current state to, uh, you know, the great white north where freedom is, to go back to the <laughs> Underground Railroad analogy. But we do have a shared intention around what that might look like. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, differences between hubs, um, architecturally there's a lot of differences, although um, we learn from each other um, in terms of how to design collaborative workspaces. Mm -hmm. We're really such as oh, uh, so uh, all sorts of things. Um, you know, people uh, love to be in community, love to have collaborative space, but they also need privacy options. So one of the phrases that I've used to describe um, our design here in Seattle is that um, community is the default, but privacy is the option. Uh, meaning that there's small rooms where you can go into for an hour. Um, you can reserve them very low tech by writing your name on the glass wall <laughs> at a certain time slot during the day. Um, and we copied that um, directly from other hubs. So we learned from them in terms of that need for private options, whether a phone mm -hmm. call or a small uh, in-person meeting. Um, so certainly space design is one element where you see some differences. In terms of um, community, uh, there's different size of impact hubs, um, ranging from tens of members to hundreds of members. 
Um, there's different program focuses. Um, a lot of uh, impact hubs uh, have some version of an incubator or accelerator program mm -hmm. where they're working with idea stage ventures mm -hmm. and saying, we think that by bringing you together and giving you workshops and resources and access to mentors and, and peer collaboration that we can help um, move you faster toward what it is you're trying to build. And um, you've got that here. We uh, are privileged to have a wonderful partnership with Fledge.co, which uh, is our in-house conscious company incubator. Uh, we also have a partnership with Kick, which is called the Inclusive Incubator. Uh, in the startup space, primarily in tech, sometimes incubators are seen as very exclusive. You have to be at a certain level to have access to the resources. So we kind of flip that paradigm on its head. And when I say we, I should really say the managing partner, Looney Libus, flipped that paradigm on its head and said, I want to make an incubator that anyone um, can access. What's the hub around the world that, that you look at as a model for you? Well, that's a great question. Um, I draw inspiration from a lot of them. Um, I think that um, the impact hubs in Australia are doing fascinating things. Um, the, the founder down there, Brad, has really thought a lot about how we can influence more traditional corporations. And so he helps them uh, do a lot of workshops and trainings around the collaborative economy, mm -hmm. um, teaching you know, uh, very large um, companies what it means to, to exist in a world where um, Zipcar and Cardigo and shared car um, options are becoming not just the exception, but the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that affect um, these companies which have existed in a non-collaborative economy for so long? Uh, so I draw inspiration from Brad's programming. I draw a lot of inspiration from the design of the hubs in London. Um, really incredible. Indy Johar is uh, an incredible architect who is also the uh, founder of a hub in London, an impact hub in London that's just beautifully designed. He's, um, he and his uh, architect team are the winners of a TED Prize for creating a, a, a wiki house that can basically, um, it's open sourcing architecture and you can download and, and print with the, um, uh, you can download the CAD design for a house and basically print and assemble it. Um, with a CNC router. Uh, so they have those as their meeting rooms. Oh my um, gosh. And they're also being installed in favelas at the same time. So <laughs> just incredible design there. So I draw a lot of inspiration for them. In terms of community, Tatiana Glad out of Hub Amsterdam is a phenomenal community curator. Um, she's been highly influential in the art of hosting um, programs, which has become a worldwide phenomenon of how do you really hold the space for a community, hold the space for the conversation that wants to take place there, and not presume you know what that is, mm -hmm. but create an opportunity that that can surface. And so Tatiana has been an incredible mentor and resource and inspiration in that regard. A couple of, couple of questions you gotta get to. Yeah. Um, number one, you mentioned the traditional corporations and you were talking about it with regard to Australia. Uh, is there a place for the traditional corporation at Impact Hubs? I think so. Um, we uh, obviously have a fair amount of members who are not working um, nine to five jobs at another office in town. But we also have a lot of members who come to us in after hours or before hours. They come to us to get that other passion piece of their project done, mm. um, either through an event or through um, just utilizing the workspace and the meeting space. Um, but we've also partnered with um, a few larger companies and um, we think that we can really be a, an incredible um, neutral space for conversations around corporate social responsibility um, and uh, other issues that are of interest of what does it mean to be a good citizen as a large corporation in today's world. And so we love hosting those conversations. Mm. Uh, well, you have two very significant partners here at Impact Hub Seattle. One of them is the Bainbridge Graduate Institute and the other one is Social Venture Partners. And there may be others, but, but those two pretty significant partners. Uh, how do they fit into all of this? Yeah, so uh, we, uh, as you can tell from the conversation, um, really try to inhabit the space between uh, business in terms of traditional market-driven capitalism and um, philanthropy in terms of 
making a dent in the universe that's positive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having partners at the forefront of either of those worlds is an incredible gift to both us uh, and our members. Bainbridge Graduate Institute was the US's first sustainable MBA program. It's still top ranked according to a lot of raging agencies. I know I read the net impact rankings mm -hmm. um, and they were at the top there. And they've been tapped to help teach other MBA programs how to incorporate sustainability into their curriculum. It's now a requirement of accrediting agencies that you do so. Their tagline is changing business for good. So they get to train hundreds of uh, individuals, both here in Seattle and across the US. A lot of their students fly in for their intensives once a month. It's not a traditional school in the sense that they're here full time. Mm -hmm. They're working at companies, very large companies, very small companies, very large organizations, small organizations. They fly in to Bainbridge to get their training and they get to see really interesting leveraged um, results because they're working with folks who might have full time jobs. So in terms of incorporating sustainability into the AutoCAD design process, uh, a Bainbridge graduate student alum was largely responsible for that and AutoCAD uh, as you likely know is is the largest in that space and mm -hmm. now any architect or designer can see the sustainability effect of choosing this piece of material over that piece of material mm -hmm. and that's a direct result of the training uh, that they received at Bainbridge Graduate Institute. Social Venture Partners is um, more on the venture philanthropy side of things. So they um, bring together individual members who collectively pool um, a limited por portion of their resources for grant making, but they also offer their own talent knowledge. And so it's a lot of business leaders in the city. I think they have over 600 partners here in Seattle alone where they launched who come together and really say, what do we want Seattle to look like? So they have a focus on their given city, but through Social Venture Partners International, which is based here in Seattle, they have over 30 sites worldwide where they're asking the same question. We've seen it in Tokyo, um, where there's a lot of overlap between Impact Hub Tokyo and SVP Tokyo, um, and they're helping really advance for the first um, stage of the conversation what philanthropy looks like, like in Japanese society, which is a, an exciting and new question in many parts of the country. Hmm. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So we gotta, we, I gotta leave you with this one question. If we were sitting here in the same place five years from now and I were to ask you, how did you do with Impact Hub, what would you say? Hmm. I think that uh, Seattle will be known for grunge, for tech, for coffee, and for impact. And so we'll have made our city famous for being uh, a place where inspiring entrepreneurs come to launch world-changing ventures. We'll have seen an ecosystem where funders don't say, I'm ready to give out of both my philanthropic and investment pocket, but I can't find investable social ventures, to a place where there's a steady deal flow of investors who are putting their capital up to build the world they want to live in. And we'll be a place where we have incredible stories of entrepreneurs who have brought them whole, their whole selves to their ventures and can say, look at this. This is something that made me come alive and made the world a better place at the same time. Brian Howe, Impact Hub. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Rainmaker believes 